It's 1986, and Australia's West is booming. Led by tycoons like Alan Bond, Robert Holmes Accord, Lang Hancock, the West Australian capital Perth seems to be set for a long run of prosperity. I'm Steve Liebman, and three years earlier, just offshore here in Fremantle, our 12 meaty yachtsmen are reveling in the glory of their famous America's Cup win. But the dark underbelly of this thriving city is soon to be exposed by two shocking crimes. One will remain unsolved for 15 years, in fact, until a dedicated young police officer makes a remarkable breakthrough. First, the story of the most reviled couple this state has known, a deadly husband and wife who plot to kidnap, rape and murder innocent young women. But it's also the story of a courageous young girl, an intended victim, who makes an incredible escape from Perth's House of Horrors. In late 1986, there's a growing sense of unease in Perth as several young women mysteriously disappear. Fremantle-based Detective Sergeant Paul Ferguson is handed a missing persons file prepared by the Major Crime Squad on 22-year-old Mary Nielsen, who disappeared on her way home from work. And it was totally out of character of, of this girl and a number of the other girls. So as a result, uh, the Major Crime Unit uh, were looking at the possibility of a, a, a person or a number of people that were uh, kidnapping these girls and consequently murdering these girls. 22-year-old Mary Nielsen has been missing since early October. Her car dumped in a car park opposite Perth Police Headquarters. In late October, Detective Sergeant Ferguson receives a call about another missing woman, 21-year-old Denise Brown. She'd been at a friend's place in Kerbala. Uh, she'd left there, she was heading off home and she hadn't arrived home. Um, and this had happened on the, uh, on the uh, Saturday and I got the phone call on the Sunday. So we were very fortunate as much as uh, we got early warning in relation to this young lady being Denise Brown. At the end of uh, that Sunday, uh, I was fairly certain uh, through gut feeling, and I mean a, a policeman uh, need to work on gut feelings, uh, but uh, as a result of speaking with the mother and, and all the friends, I was relatively certain that uh, this was out of character for Denise Brown and that uh, she was subject of uh, foul play. Paul Ferguson is working on the Denise Brown case when a call comes in. I got a phone call, I got a call over the radio from uh, Chris Cassidy, who was another sergeant down at uh, Fremantle at the time, to say that they were speaking to a young lady who had told them something and it, was, uh, it could be connected to the Denise Brown file and that I should come and speak with her. Detective Sergeant Chris Cassidy tells Ferguson about a young woman who claims she's been kidnapped and taken to a house where she says she was raped, held captive, chained to a bed. Can you tell us where you met she manages to escape and tells her story to Chris Cassidy. She was just so convincing and so genuine that I had no hesitation in accepting what she'd told us, so we moved. So then I asked her the obvious question, would you identify the, the house? And she said, oh, I think so, yeah, it's not that far from here. So um, we said, right, I, uh, in the, she was in the back seat, so we drove her past and uh, um, as covertly as we could and she, um, and she looked at the house and she ducked down and, and burst into tears, which was really the first sign of emotion, and she said, that's the house. I said, OK. Paul Ferguson speaks with the young woman, we'll call her Katie, He's looking for connections with Denise Brown, Mary Nielsen, and other missing person cases. Katie tells him she was walking along the highway when a car pulled up. A woman called her over and asked the location of a particular street, which just happened to be the street where Denise Brown lived. Katie was then grabbed and pulled into the car. The woman was armed with a knife. Katie's story and the Denise Brown connection spur police into action. 
from there, um, uh, that was sufficient uh, information to be able to go to a Justice of the Peace, get a warrant to go and search the place. And of course, once we searched the place, that was that gave us uh, uh, an opportunity to enter the place, to, uh, in actual fact, speak to the occupant of the place, and then from there it just unfolded. The house in question is in Morehouse Street, Willoughby, a short drive east of Fremantle. It's open, Rick. A quick search of the unoccupied and unlocked premises yields evidence that corroborates Katie's story. Police stake out the house and wait for the occupants to return home. A short time later, a female arrived home who we ascertained to be uh, Catherine Burney. Um, no, she wasn't surprised to see us. She was quite aggressive. Um, and, um, and she was told that we were making inquiries in relation to a young lady who had been uh, reported to us that she had been abducted and, and held captive in her house and raped. And she denied any knowledge of it. I know nothing. As a result of speaking with her, she told us that uh, she lived at that, uh, that address with a male person by the name of David Burney. Uh, she told us that they weren't married, but she had changed the name by deed poll to his name. David Burney worked at a uh, wreckage yard close by, and uh, a couple of people were then sent out to uh, speak with him and bring him back to the office. David and Catherine Burney had first met and become a couple in their teens, but they gradually drift apart, later marrying other partners and having their own families. David Burney spent some time working in the stables of Perth trainer Eric Parnham in the early 1960s. Eric recalls his first impressions. Tell you what, I reckon snow wouldn't have melted his mouth because he never done not one thing wrong at my place. And I had, I think I had two little kids and a wife, and he could have mucked around, but no, not a word. But there's one incident involving an elderly woman who ran a boarding house for apprentice jockeys. She claims that Bernie tried to rape her. I said, turn it up, he's a runt. I said, you'd step on him and you'd kill him. But she was a pretty big woman. And uh, she said, luckily I had the little dog. Oh, she loved the little dog. And apparently, when he was going through the window and she slammed the window, the little dog was on the window too. And he, uh, Tom Shaw was next door in those days in the house, and he, he could hear the dog. He was going mad. To this day, Parnham still has a bank book that David Burney left behind when he suddenly departed the stables. In the early 1980s, David and Catherine Burney meet up again and begin living together. David Burney tells Catherine of his desire to participate in group sex. How can it be great? Catherine tries to entice a female friend to join them, but she declines. Then they begin to look further afield for women to participate either willingly or unwillingly. And that was what they were planning to do with Katie, the young woman who later escapes. Look, look, look. Yeah, 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 I saw her, I saw her. What do you reckon? Detectives interview David Burney, who admits to having sex with Katie, the alleged kidnap victim, but he insists it was consensual. Yeah. Ferguson is sure Burney's implicated in other missing persons cases, and he senses that Burney wants to tell him more. Just tell us what happened for their sake. And uh, he looked at me and then he looked up at Vince and he said, can I speak to Cathy? Can I speak to Cathy? Well, once again, uh, I, I can only tell you from uh, the old gut feeling, you know, when he, when he said that, I thought that, you know, gee, he, he's right on the edge. He wanted confirmation from her to be able to go further. After speaking with his de facto, David Burney comes back to police with a story that confirms their worst fears. He admits that he and Catherine have committed no less than four brutal murders. A Perth couple, David and Catherine Burney, are prime suspects in several missing persons cases in the Perth area in late 1986. Bill Power is a police roundsman with a major Western Australian newspaper. 
police headquarters in uh, East Perth was just alive with talk. The airwaves on the police channels was, was chatter, chatter, chatter about something going on, but nobody was saying what. Um, and of course we started to pick this up and you know, after a while you get a feel for um, the story. We knew something was on and then someone dropped the line somewhere, um, I think it was on a radio, about the missing women and that linked it all up. And so we knew the police had a major breakthrough. The breakthrough is sudden and staggering. When interviewed by Detective Sergeant Paul Ferguson and Senior Sergeant Four. Vince Cadage, David Burney makes an extraordinary confession. I don't know whether it was just Vince and I were a, were a good team or I, I don't know, but at that particular point without any gap at all, Vince, who was standing behind me, looked down at David and said, come on, David, come on, how many is there? And he looked at Vince and he said, there's four. And, and as quick as a flash, Vince came back and said, uh, do you know who they Ford, are? do you know who they are? What's their, name? What's their names? And he named the four girls. Mary Nielsen, Sue Candy, Nolan Patterson, Denise Brown, well, of course, we were aware of uh, Denise Brown, we were aware of, um, of uh, Mary Nielsen, but the other two names we weren't aware of at all. So things sort of just snowball from there. David Burney agrees to take police to where the bodies are buried. At first, Catherine Burney makes no admissions, but she's taken to the scene in a separate car, accompanied by Detective Sergeant Chris Cassidy and another officer. On learning that her de facto has admitted to four murders, she too breaks down and confesses. And from that point on, it was just uh, the dam broke and um, she went right through the, um, the whole story as to, and she was, I mean, I, we, uh, her, uh, myself in the back seat and Bob Hersey drove the, the vehicle and um, from that point on, you know, I could, I was battling to keep up with handwriting um, what she was saying. Um, and just directing us to the bodies and, um, and as to who they were. The Burnies escort police to a shallow grave in Wanneroo, 80 kilometres south of Perth. David Burney tells police that he and Catherine were prowling Stirling Highway looking for a suitable victim, a young woman they could kidnap, rape and murder. On the evening of November the 4th, 1986, they saw Denise Brown hitchhiking and offered her a lift. Oh, it's jump in the back. Once in the car, Catherine Burney pulled the knife and then bound Denise's hands with cable ties. Come on, get them on, go, drive and drive. <laughs> they then took their victim to their house at Morehouse Street, Willoughby. Come on, Denise, it's gonna be all right, sweetie. No, we're just gonna make She was forced to remove clothing and jewelry. Take a photo, come on, come on, sweetie. Oh. Catherine made a meticulous list of Denise's clothing and personal effects before watching as David Burney brutally raped the young woman. She was then made to take a sleeping pill, chained to a bed and held overnight. The following morning, Denise was forced to ring a friend to say she'd be away for a few days. Hi, Jen. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine, yeah. That afternoon, Denise was taken by car to the Nangara Pine Plantation in Wanneroo. <laughs> David Burney raped her again. Yes, hey, Denise. <laughs> and then he cut her throat. <laughs> he dug a shallow grave and threw Denise into it and began to fill it with sand. When Denise was hit by the sand, she suddenly inhaled and sat up. She wasn't dead. Um, whether she was unconscious or whether she was lying doggo uh, to try and try and save herself, uh, she, she was put into the gravesite. She laid there. Both Dave and, and, and Kathy told us that, that their words freaked them out. Um, David had a, uh, an axe in the, in the boot of his car. He ran to the boot of the car, got the axe, and the back of the axe, he, he actually hit her, hit her in the head on two occasions to, uh, to um, kill her. Bernie now agrees to take police to the other three bodies, buried here in a forest at Glen Eagles. We turned left where he told us to turn left, 
Uh, and he said, right, stop there. There's a log over there. Behind that log is the body of Sue Candy. 16 years old Susanna Candy was picked up by the Burnies on October the 20th. And like Denise Brown, she was kidnapped, drugged, raped and chained to a bed. With little Sue Candy, um, Cathy also got her to write three letters. Those three letters were then um, uh, put into envelopes and subsequently uh, the first letter that Sue wrote uh, was posted uh, the day that she was killed. Uh, the second letter was posted a week later and the third letter was posted uh, two weeks after she was killed. She said she liked me. David Burney later admits that he raped and strangled the 16-year-old girl, then placed her body in the boot of his car, drove to Glen Eagles and buried her. Burney now takes police to a third body, that of 22-year-old Mary Nielsen, the first of the four women to go missing. David, Mary's here. Hi. Hi, Mary. Mary had driven to the Burney's Morehouse Street address in the belief that she could buy discounted car tyres. But she was quickly overpowered and chained to a bed. David Burney then drove Mary's vehicle into town and dumped it in a car park opposite police headquarters. He uh, walked up into the city where he caught a taxi and was then dropped off at the shopping centre some 200 metres from where he lived. He then walked back home where he uh, then sexually assaulted uh, Mary uh, again and then uh, placed her in the, um, in the vehicle while she was still alive uh, and, um, and drove her to Glen Eagle where she was then sexually assaulted again and strangled. The Burney's third known victim, but the last body found, is 31 years old Nolene Patterson. She was buried uh, the other side of the highway, uh, away from the other two girls. And uh, um, when he conveyed us over there, in actual fact, um, Kathy Tell Burney that said that she wanted to point what out uh, where Nolene. Uh, Nolene was buried. Kathy refused to she refer to Nolene by name, she just called her that woman. Uh, and uh, as, uh, as the inquiry unfolded, we, we ascertained that because Nolene was 31 years of age, she was uh, mature, what she tried was a bit of reverse psychology and she tried to befriend David to see if she could uh, talk a way out of being killed. I like you too. <sighs> After holding Nolene in captivity for two days, the Burnies have a major argument. It's all right. She's fine. Me or her? In an insane fit of jealousy, Catherine storms out of the house. When she returns, she delivers a bizarre ultimatum. And uh, subsequently, Cathy actually offered to kill herself if David want to, wanted to uh, be with Nolene. And um, David said that Nolene was different from the other girls and she deserved to be put into a different place to the other girls. She was, in actual fact, uh, buried with her knickers still on and, as I say, away from the other two girls. But, uh, but um, Kathy was the first one to point to uh, Nolene's grave. In actual fact, when she walked up to the grave, she actually spat on the grave. The relationship between David and Catherine Burney is clearly sick and twisted. But what is it that has taken them over the edge and into murder? Kathy, I would say, was the, was the principal organiser of this, this whole um, thing, uh, in as much as she had a belief that uh, women were put on this earth to, um, to look after men and service men and, and, and do what men wanted, and that uh, she believed that David had been hurt by women, so therefore women should pay. She had absolutely no... Uh, qualms at all that uh, of killing women. Whether one led the other or vice versa, I think they are equal, equally culpable and equally as um, evil. But even the word evil doesn't seem to fit to my. It seems to be a, an understatement. It becomes clear to police that David and Catherine Burney developed a deadly method for selecting their victims, and Catherine was calling the shots. And then once they picked 
uh, someone up. Uh, Cathy would then decide on who David could have or who he could not have, and they developed a code. I've got munchies, David. So if they yes. pick someone up, um, Cathy, if she agreed that David could have this particular girl, Cathy would say, I've got the munchies. David would say either He's yes or no. If he said yes, Cathy would then pull out a little knife. She would then swing around, hold the knife at the, uh, at the throat of the victim. Uh, they had uh, the cable ties, put them around the victim's hands uh, and throw a blanket over them and then uh, take them uh, to uh, Three More House Street. After kidnapping, raping and murdering at least four young women, the Burnies set their sights on another victim on the evening of November the 9th, 1986. Their target is 17-year-old Katie. But it's this young woman's courage and resourcefulness that will help police put an end to their killing spree. And her story of survival and escape is a remarkable one. By the end of 1986, Perth's husband and wife serial killers, David and Catherine Burney, have confessed to murdering four young women. As the police continue to prepare evidence for court proceedings against the Burneys, the full details of an amazing story emerge. The story of the young woman who outwitted the murderous couple, escaped from their clutches, and then helped police to track them down. He raped me. Katie was chosen to be victim number five, a plaything for David Burney to rape and murder. Police have no doubt that if it hadn't been for Katie's quick thinking and courage, the killings would have continued. She later tells her story to Detective Neville Collard. And he was this 17 year old beautiful young lady and it struck me at the time that I was dealing with a very, very smart, switched on young 17 year old girl. She told me that She'd asked um, Catherine Burney for a notepad because she wanted to write a letter to her boyfriend because she felt that this was going to be the last opportunity that she had to leave messages and notes for her parents and for her boyfriend. But these are no ordinary notes. Katie and her boyfriend have devised a secret code for communicating with each other. So Katie makes a note of the Burney's phone number ending in 3337 and writes it down in this obscure code. And she'd written down in code, she put three trees, three ferns, she put three pine trees, she put seven houses. And there was a whole lot of little um, notations that she made to make up the phone number. She'd put on this bit of paper. Katie manages to bargain with the Burnies to untie her. Whenever Catherine leaves the room where Katie's being held, the young captive plants some of her personal effects. She's convinced that she will be murdered, and she wants to leave behind clues to incriminate her killers. She plants her driver's license in a stove and stuffs other personal documents into hiding places around the room. Katie later tells Detective Sergeant Chris Cassidy about the moment of opportunity that saved her life. Look at the door and Kathy allowed it, released her from the um, uh, from the bed and uh, allowed her to watch television. But um, whilst they were doing that, there was a knock on the door, which was actually a drug deal. Um, they were selling cannabis at the time, and uh, so she put her in the bedroom, but she didn't secure her to the bed. So she took the opportunity to get out the window, and, um, and that's uh, and the rest is history. Sandy Holloway moved into Morehouse Street a few months after the Burney's terrible crimes were exposed. She's able to retrace Katie's movements immediately after her escape. The young girl broke out of this window here in the front and just grabbed the opportunity to do so and went down. She knocked on a couple of doors down the street, nobody home, ran right down and up the laneway I burst into this delicatessen and I was just screaming and waving my arms around and telling them, you know, what had happened to me and they didn't believe me. And why would people believe me? It's too much. A search of the Morehouse Street property corroborates Katie's story. She said that she was given a sleeping pill which she spat out. Uh, that pill was an actual fa found on the floor in the bedroom. Um, 
She said that she had been chained up uh, and uh, the locks had been used and there was numbers on the locks. We found some chains and some locks with numbers on them. So there was a lot of uh, evidence found that was subsequently used at the uh, court, but also uh, corroborated the story given by the young lady. Police have no doubt that if it hadn't been for Katie's quick thinking and courage, the killings would have continued. David and Catherine Burney both plead guilty to four counts of willful murder, one count of deprivation of liberty, and two counts of aggravated sexual assault. David Burney appears before the Perth Supreme Court on February the 10th, 1987. Journalist Bill Power recalls the public reaction outside the court. It was quite amazing scenes. And of course, when they, um, when they got them outside, there was a, a big wire cage attached to the side of the um, Supreme Court building. And they'd back a, a vehicle in there, a prison vehicle, and they brought them out. The public could see these people. I couldn't get to them. But there was a, a large gathering of people um, outside this cage. And they were just directing this venom at them, this absolute hatred. David Burney is sentenced to life imprisonment under strict security and he needs all the security he can get. He's reviled by other prisoners and he's frequently bashed. On March the 3rd, 1987, Catherine Burney has her day in court and she is also sentenced to life under strict security. But even though this pair has been brought to justice for four killings, investigators are convinced that there were other occasions when they literally got away with murder. As to who, when, where, I mean, we, we may never know until such time as the, um, the bodies are found. But yeah, I'm, I'm more than satisfied that there are more. I'm very uh, firm on the belief that uh, certainly David uh, was uh, involved in the death of, of several other young women. Uh, that Cathy, I believe, has a knowledge of those, uh, those deaths if she was not involved in them. Social law reform campaigner Brian Tennant is given access to David Burney in prison and corresponds with him. He recalls a chilling first meeting with David at Cassiarina Prison. I put it to him, I said, look, before we even get tangled and, you know, bogged down in whatever else you've, you've got on, him, on the plate, that you and Kath knock those others off. He says, yes, all right, OK, that's right. All I need to know is that. However, David Burney publicly <laughs> refutes Tennant's claim. No. He serves his sentence in protective custody until 2003. And then this. At four o'clock this morning, 54-year-old David Burney was found dead in his specialist protective custody cell. He had apparently hanged himself. Journalist Bill Power is in no doubt about how David and Catherine Burney will be remembered. He was a weedy, syphilitic little rat. She is an unattractive nobody. And they are now infamous in this nation. She has not got to my recollection, one endearing feature about her. He had nothing. He was a typical nobody. Yet he did these things that have left an indelible print on Australia. Catherine Burney can apply for parole in 2007, but it's unlikely she'll be released anytime soon. For Paul Ferguson, now a detective inspector, the thought of her ever being released is not one he cares to contemplate. Inspector Paul Ferguson doesn't have an opinion. It's up to the system to, uh, to deal with it the way it happens. Paul Ferguson, the man, uh, would be horrified if that woman was ever released back into the public. For the residents of this quiet suburb, nothing can undo or erase the unspeakable acts that David and Catherine Burney committed in their house of horrors in Morehouse Street. <laughs> Come on. Come on. 
on a steamy summer night in 1986 in the northern Perth suburb of Leaderville, a call girl is murdered in one of the most violent and bloody crimes the city has ever seen. This is the story of how a brutal killer was caught after 15 years, how a classic cold case was solved using smart technology, teams of police investigators, and especially one very determined and dedicated young detective. After midnight in the suburbs of Perth, all is quiet. But beneath this calm surface, the hidden business of the night goes on. The prostitution agencies supplying sex services for the lonely. Selling sex is a dangerous business, especially at night, when call girls attend to strangers at their homes or in hotel rooms, with no way to screen out the customers who might turn violent. It's the 29th of January, 1986. Rosalind Watson, a 41-year-old world-weary sex worker, is waiting for new business at an escort agency. I wasted all that time now. Roz is in a very bad mood, having just returned from a cancelled job. In this profession, it's strictly no work, no pay. It's not long, however, before things begin to look up when a man named John calls the agency. John? He wants a lady sent to him at an address in Burke Street, Leaderville. He and says he'll need her for three hours. And your number, John. The agency manager asks John for his Sorry. phone number and calls him back. It's no guarantee of safety, John? but it provides Kevin some Kevin. identification. She's on her way. Roz takes the job and drives to Leaderville. Bye. John? G'day. Come in. On her arrival, she follows standard procedure and phones the agency. She also tells them there's a problem. John is searching for his wallet. The golden rule in this game, always get the money first. She waits on the line while he searches, getting more and more irritated. And then she says she'll call back when he finds it. It's the last time anyone will hear from Rosalind Watson. By the time the alarm is raised, she's dead. Detective Inspector Bill Dunlop is put in charge of the investigation after receiving a call to attend the homicide scene. What had happened was that her body had been, her body had been pushed from, from the centre of the lounge into a corner. And obviously I, I, I think that the offender was still there when the, the local police turned up to see, uh, find out where she was. Um, they'd have looked in the window, which they did, and they shone their torches in, and, and the offender pushed the body away from the view of the window where, so you couldn't see it. Now, um, she was in a fairly, uh, fairly bad way. The, the body was covered in blood, and, and she'd, uh, she'd had a, a black dress on, which, uh, which had been cut up the middle and up around her neck. Um, the body was smeared with blood, all hand marks all over. Police are puzzled as to what could have motivated such a violent attack. Forensic pathologist Dr John Hilton is called in. Yeah, well, at the time, I think um, it was pretty, fairly obvious it wasn't the usual run-of-the-mill domestic murder. God, it was, God. if you can call it an attack, a vicious, certainly a vicious attack. It appeared even at that time as if there was a psychosexual motive to the killing. Um, there was the possibility of pseudo-machistic sexual practices being performed. Detectives have no witnesses and few leads. They do have some forensic evidence, including a knife in a kitchen drawer carrying traces of blood later identified as the murder weapon. There's also a leather boot lace binding Roz's hands, on which the police lab later finds traces of motor oil. The, it wasn't entirely clear initially just, just um, what was implied by the scene, but it appeared that um, her wrists were tied together more tethered together than tied together. Um, there was loops of a leather thong 
around each wrist, but there was a fair separation of the um, of the two wrists. In fact, one was in front of her, the other one was behind their back, you couldn't see it. Um, there was a lot of blood smearing in the body, in all parts of the body. Uh, there was a series of um, penetrating wounds to her left breast in particular, um, at least one of which had gone right through the breast and had come out the other side and impinged on her arm. They find a wine glass, some cigarette butts, and even a few hairs. But this is 1986, and the science of extracting and identifying DNA evidence from a crime scene has not yet been developed. There are no useful fingerprints, but there is a palm print near the side window where the killer entered the house. We examined that side window, and we found on the window an indent of, of uh, like jeans or clothing, because it was the window had been painted with, with the white paint, and you could see where someone had put their feet down the ground, put their, their uh, backside on the on the window ledge, and got in through that window, which was open at the time. You know, the blind was pulled down. Fingerprint expert Detective Greg Walker attends the scene and finds a partial print on the window. In a digital print, which is a palm print, uh, was off the point of entry. And just from its location and the way it was facing, we knew, uh, well, I knew that the, uh, the print was, uh, the print was uh, from the point of entry and the person had been climbing in through the window. Detective Walker is in no doubt the palm print belongs to the murderer. The only way police can try to match the palm print with prints on police files is to compare them manually. It's a monumental task, as fingerprint expert Barry Fay explains. Actually, it was impossible in those days to identify a, a sole palm print without any backup of fingerprints to search. There were systems in place, special systems. They used to call them uh, singles, where fingerprints were all cut up one by one of well-known people and filed away unclassified to such a degree that a single fingerprint could be filed and found. But with palm prints, you couldn't do that. Palm prints covered a multitude of patterns. They could be wall patterns, arch patterns, loop patterns, whereas a fingerprint only had the one type of pattern. So therefore, palm prints were no value to a fingerprint man until he actually had a good suspect to check. With no obvious suspects, police now look into Ros's background. They find no enemies, nothing. They interview the owner of the house who's been on holiday, but she has no information. They comb the area, door knocking. The neighbours have heard nothing. As the murder continues to make headlines, police get helpful calls from the public, including one from a woman who says her ex-husband, an itinerant mechanic named Alex McKenzie, could be the killer. She says she's been with him to the house to buy a car a month or so before the murder. Mackenzie now lives in a caravan park not far from the murder scene, and the investigators decide to pay him a visit. He was fairly well hung over and just denied ever leaving the caravan. Just, I never moved. We had a barbecue, uh, uh, drunk quite a lot of beer. Uh, I never moved. I, I was with my friend all night. Um, and we got a statement of that effect from him, that he'd, uh, he hadn't... hadn't left the caravan that night um, and his friend sort of his friend corroborated police are convinced the killer has some connection with the house and knew the phone okay. number there as right. alex mckenzie does detectives continue to interview okay. various tradesmen and delivery people but despite launching a massive investigation they have no positive leads and the murder inquiry comes to a dead end that's where the story would have ended with a brutal killer on the loose free to strike again. However, the tenacity of a smart and enthusiastic young cop and some powerful new technology will break open the case, but not for another 15 years. The body of Rosalind Watson, with 27 stab wounds, has been found in a vacant house in the Perth suburb of Leederville. But there's no motive, no witness, and no definitive suspect. 
All police have to go on are a few scraps of evidence, including an unidentified palm print. Her killer remains free and the case turns cold. Detective Inspector Bill Dunlop, heading the investigation, remains frustrated. I was quite, um, quite happy to, to have the file go to the coroner. Um, there comes a point in an investigation where you do exhaust or avenues of inquiry and uh, you've got to move on to other things. And uh, that's what you do. You, 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 you wrap, the, wrap the inquiry up and put as much as you can uh, there together in the event that, that something else will come up. And that's exactly what happens. But it'll take 15 years before the file into Roslyn Watson's murder is reopened. Early in 2001, a massive new computer system is introduced that can store all police fingerprints from around Australia. It has the ability to compare large numbers of whole palm prints. About a million or so palm prints were fed into the computer on their database and latent matching began. There were a number of cases in every state where only palm prints was the evidence that was forthcoming to solve it. Scott Higgins, a young detective on the major crime squad, is there when a breakthrough is made. OK, they were prioritising a lot of their work back in, at that stage because it's a fairly labour-intensive job and they were getting out all the cold cases, as in all the unsolved that they've got. Well, we've got our files in our office, they've got their files from the forensic side of things. And they're looking at the old cases, ones which had been around for a while and ones which had a uh, possible chance of getting something out of it and this was one of the ones and so they, they fed this one through and they got the result. Detective Higgins is working one morning when a group of excited investigators arrives. And it was the f uh, fingerprint division people who came up to Curtin House, the CLB headquarters, saying we've got a hit for you, we've got a hit for you. The new evidence the fingerprint team has uncovered relates to the murder of Rosalind Watson 15 years earlier. This was just the sort of case a young, ambitious detective could get his teeth into. The palm print is identified as coming from the hand of itinerant mechanic Alexander Oliver Mackenzie. Mackenzie's prints had been recorded in police files when he was convicted of an attempted sexual assault in Perth in May 1986, four months after the murder of Ros Watson. But at the time, the technology was too primitive to identify that palm print as being his. Mackenzie had picked up a young woman whose car had broken down. Scott Higgins digs out the old files. He offered to drive her to a, um, a service station, a 24-hour service station. Within about five minutes of getting into the car, he produced a screwdriver, threatened her, said he wanted to have sex with her. She screamed and begged for her life and said, look, please don't kill me, please don't kill me, leave me, leave me alone, let me go. And again, he drove her to um, uh, a different location, let her go to another service station and just let, let her go. She went and called the police and of course he was arrested and charged and convicted for that offence. Higgins is excited, but Mackenzie's palm print, newly identified by the fingerprint experts as matching the one found at the murder scene, is still not enough to positively identify him as the killer. After all, Mackenzie could have left the palm print when he visited the house to buy the car a month before the Watson murder. The dating of fingerprint evidence is a difficult science. There are so many variables involved. For example, if a man painted his window a week before the perpetrator touched it, then that does prove the age of that particular palm print. However, if the window was painted three years earlier and the criminal, in this case the killer, had some sort of grime or even sebum, oil and grease you make on your own hands, that grimy substance found on the steering wheel of your car is sebum. If he had a lot of that, he may leave a deposit of a palm print that would last for two years. It depends on many variables. Detective Higgins must find harder evidence before he can arrest Mackenzie. Yep. He does have one slim lead, Mackenzie's ex-wife. She also knew that he'd been involved in a previous attack on a prostitute 
about a year earlier, there'd been a similar attack on a young girl in Fremantle. The only difference was with this one was that the girl wasn't killed. But would this be the breakthrough Detective Higgins is looking for? He probes deeper. Detective Higgins. The victim of that assault is Julianne, a mother of two who secretly decides to make some quick money by working for an escort agency. Unbelievably, her first client is Alex McKenzie, who ties her up and sexually assaults her. But when she cries and pleads for her life, he lets her go. Julianne does not report the crime, but Detective Higgins knows she's the crucial witness he needs. If he can track her down, he must somehow persuade her to come out of hiding, admit that she once tried prostitution, and then get her to sign a statement identifying Mackenzie as her attacker. It wasn't going to be easy. She pretty much got on with her life, remarried, uh, moved, and had you know, forgotten about it. So when I rang her out of the blue, she was very, very concerned. And it took me a few months to actually convince her to to be uh, re-interviewed to the point of giving a statement and she actually gave us more detail and more evidence which became very important once we got her trust. The pieces of the that jigsaw are falling into place and Detective Higgins decides to act. So we reached the decision in uh, I think October of 2001, we'd reached the point where we've pretty much done all we could do and the next point Thanks, was sir. to grab hold of McKenzie and bring him in for, for an interview. Higgins has two teams of experienced homicide investigators go to work on Mackenzie. The first is himself and Detective Senior Constable Rousen. The interview goes in circles as Mackenzie steadfastly denies everything. I haven't been at Burke Street, all right? During six hours of interrogation, Mackenzie tells detectives he has memory loss due to bouts of excessive drinking. Mackenzie can't even remember when he married his wife or the age of their child, let alone being questioned about the earlier attack on the stranded girl for which he's jailed. Higgins then raises the murder of Roz Watson. I know you've been to Burke Street. Don't sit here in front of us and lie. You have been to Burke Street. You did kill her, Alex. You know a lot, Alex. You think it through very hard. Having softened up Mackenzie, Higgins now decides to bring in the second team, Detective Superintendent David Caporn and Detective Inspector Kevin Luby. We could see he wanted to tell us, but he just needed a different approach, a different interview team. Is there anything you'd like to tell us? That different approach is slightly softer, and that's all it takes. Higgins is watching on a video monitor in another room. I told her she had shut up. And finally he knows he's got his man. And we knew, OK, he's going to tell us now. And then he said, OK, what do you want to know? And then he just told the story about what had happened. She upset you. Mackenzie tells how he lured Roz to a vacant house in the Perth suburbs and then pretended he has lost his wallet. She came into the house. But he had no intention of paying. He'd been drinking heavily all night. He was armed with a knife from the kitchen as well as a screwdriver and had a leather bootlace with which to restrain her. But Roz Watson was not the type to weep and plead for her life like his other victims. When he demanded sex for free, she told him exactly what she thought of him. No, get off me, you little shit! That he was a time waster and a loser. Mackenzie produced a knife and threatened Roz. She screamed and lashed out. He overpowered her and bound her wrists together with the leather bootlace. But she wouldn't stop struggling and screaming. And that's when he completely lost control. In a frenzy, he stabbed her more than 20 times. I told you to shut your mouth! As she lay dying, he leaned over her, breathing heavily, his hands, arms, his whole body covered in her blood. He cut her dress away and then produced a screwdriver and stabbed her again in her chest and arms. Roz Watson's courage had cost her her life. Mackenzie was in the bathroom washing off the blood when there was a knock at the front door. The manager of the escort agency had called the police. He stood still, still dripping blood. The police patrol knocked again. A torch beam shone in through various windows. Mackenzie crept into the lounge room and quietly pulled Roz's bleeding body to one side, out of sight, just as the police torch beam silently swept the room. The police left. 
After showering and wiping down the bathroom, Mackenzie escaped. It was 3 a.m. and the neighbors had heard and seen nothing. It takes another two and a half years to get the case to trial, but eventually Mackenzie is convicted of Rosalind Watson's murder. Detective Higgins remembers the moment the jury announced its verdict. On the inside, I was jumping up and down, um, but on the outside, obviously, I've got, to, I've got to keep a fairly professional and, and composed approach. Outside court, Mackenzie's ex-wife, Ann Davies, said justice had been done. I'm happy that he's not going to be able to do this to any other woman for a long, long time because I believe he's going to re-offend. Ms Davies said the verdict had at last brought closure for herself and her daughter. I think just having to listen to the horrific evidence and the fact that perhaps it could have been you. How would you describe your ex-husband? A monster. Alexander Mackenzie is sentenced to 25 years in jail for Rosalind Watson's murder. A killer is locked away for life thanks to a combination of new technology, a chance call from an ex-wife who thought she might be able to help, and the dogged persistence of Detective Scott Higgins. 25 years was, was at the upper end of the scale. So he's going to be a very old man before he leaves jail, if he leaves jail.